Okay, so when we finished up last time, we talked a little bit about the early stages of what's known as the sectional conflict. That's that period when you have tension between different parts of the country, most notably between North and South, and most notably over the question of slavery and how slavery can, should, will expand into new territories as the country grows. Um, again, it's more than just that, so I don't want to play into the narrative of um, slave versus free, north versus south, because it's, it's actually way more complicated than that. But the, um, the question then becomes, how do sort of the average people in the country um, experience the question of slavery's expansion. Um, and what I mean by that is what kinds of arguments are being made either in favor of slavery or against slavery? How does slavery impact the political arena in the 1800s um, before the Civil War? And one thing that we can look at um, I don't normally like to put up a lot of maps of election results because it gets kind of boring and there's not a lot that can be um, sort of unpacked with that sometimes. But in some cases, they can give us a really interesting view of what's going on historically. And one of those is the election of 1848. So in the election of 1848, this is, you know, right at the cusp of the Mexican-American War. You have a lot of things going on. Um, but no party, right? You have the, the Whig Party, you have the Democratic Party. Neither of those major parties actually comes out and says anything specific about slavery as part of their platform. So, for instance, you know, today a party might stand on one side or the other of gun control or, you know, abortion rights or um, LGBTQ rights or, you know, any number of different kinds of issues. And they do that in order to position themselves on one side or another of a particular issue or a particular question. And in 1848, neither of those major parties really says anything about slavery. Their view is, well, we don't want to risk upsetting any potential voters by saying, oh, we're in favor of slavery's expansion, or we're against slavery's expansion. Because just like today, if a presidential or political candidate in general comes out and says, I'm against all abortions, well, that's going to upset a significant number of voters who will then say, there's no way I'm voting for that person. By the same token, if someone says, I'm thoroughly for pro-choice, that's going to upset the opposite side of the voting block that says, I'll never vote for that person. So nobody in the election of 1848 from the Whig Party or the Democratic Party for the most part, nobody is coming out and saying, I don't believe slavery should be expanded, or the opposite. And what this means is there are a lot of people in 1848 that see slavery as a significant thing on which to base their voting decision. And into that then emerges a third party called the Free Soil Party. And the Free Soil Party runs former president Martin Van Buren as their candidate for president. Now, the Free Soil Party is really, really important to remember they are not abolitionists, right? Abolitionists were people that wanted to eliminate slavery. And we'll get into all of the subtleties of that too. But abolitionists, at the core, wanted to eliminate slavery. Now, what happened after that, that was another question. The Free Soil Party were not abolitionists. The Free Soilers included some abolitionists, because that was the only party that was really addressing the slavery issue. Um, and so there were a lot of abolitionists that went that direction. 
but from the party's perspective, the party platform was to prevent expansion. So they just wanted slavery not to grow into new areas. So from a, an organizational standpoint, their position was not in favor of doing away with slavery completely, even though, yes, there were a lot of people that ended up supporting the Free Soil Party that looked in that direction, again, just because they didn't have any other options. So in 1848, you have the Whig Party and the Democratic Party, and then you have this Free Soil Party. And you can look at the map, and it's really, really interesting. Now, <clears throat> Zachary Taylor, um, the Whig candidate, wins all of the purple-colored states. Now, Zachary Taylor, he is from Louisiana. He is a slave owner. He wins Louisiana. He wins slave states like Kentucky and Georgia and North Carolina and Florida and Maryland and Delaware, right? All of those are slave states. Zachary Taylor wins New York, Pennsylvania, Vermont, Massachusetts, Connecticut, and so on. Zachary Taylor is clearly not saying, I want slavery permanent and to expand. He was probably not going to win those mid-Atlantic and New England states if he says that. By the same token, Lewis Cass, who is the Democratic candidate, the losing candidate, Lewis Cass is from Michigan. He is a northerner. Michigan, by the um, requirements of what's called the Northwest Ordinance, Michigan was prohibited from ever having slavery, ever. So it was never even a question of whether Michigan would or wouldn't. They were banned from having slavery before they even could become a state. Lewis Cass wins Maine and Ohio and Wisconsin and Indiana, right? Free states through and through. Lewis Cass also wins Mississippi, Alabama, South Carolina, Virginia, Texas. So much like Taylor wins without saying, I want slavery forever, Cass wins a lot of very slavery states because he's not saying, I want to get rid of slavery or I don't want slavery to, to expand. So you can see in this map um, a, a very graphic representation of the fact that nobody is really saying anything about slavery in the election of 1848. The Free Soil Party, if you look on the pie graphs on the right, Van Buren manages to win about 10% of the total popular vote, right? That's a big chunk. It's just because of the nature of the Electoral College, he doesn't pull down any electoral votes. But he does manage to win um, a lot of votes, indicating that there are a lot of people that are voting based almost entirely on the matter of slavery. And the Free Soil Party, even though Van Buren doesn't come out with anything tangible, the Free Soil Party manages to get 10 seats in Congress as well. So there are people talking about this. There are people that are concerned with slavery as a topic. So what kinds of arguments and comments are they actually making? So on the one side, you have the abolitionists. Um, abolitionism in the United States is a little bit behind the curve in terms of abolitionism in places, especially like Great Britain. Um, but even at that, there were people going all the way back to the Revolution that argued that slavery should not exist. Um, some states, by the time of the Constitutional Convention, had already begun the process of working abolition into their constitutions. We talked about the um, Three-Fifths Compromise. We talked about the debates about slavery during the Constitutional Convention. <clears throat> there was not a widespread effort during and immediately after the war. There was not a widespread effort to get rid of slavery. It was seen as either a very um, welcome part of the economy or sort of a, well, there's nothing we can do about it, so we might as well just accept it kind of situation. Even for the people who wanted to end slavery, 
and this is the case all the way up to and including the 1860s. Lots of those people, even people like Abraham Lincoln, believe it or not, were not in favor of, well, we should end slavery and give all people equal rights. So there's a difference between abolition, the ending of slavery, and granting equality to the people who had been slaves. So many, many people made the argument that blacks could not and should not live in American society side by side, as it were, with whites. There were a lot of people that said the only solution is colonization. Basically, taking people who had been enslaved in the, Uni the United States and freeing them, but not letting them stay inside the boundaries of the United States, instead sending them back to Africa. And this was a, a big, big effort. There was actually even the sponsorship and creation um, by American philanthropists and politicians, the creation of a country in Africa specifically designated to be the destination point for American blacks who were colonized back to Africa. There was a lot of racist arguments here. There were a lot of people that in their heart of hearts believed that what they were saying was the right thing. But basically they said it's dangerous for both sides because former slaves will want revenge on whites whether they were the ones that actually enslaved them or not, that Africans won't be able to develop their culture if they're in the United States because they'll be surrounded by a white culture that is kind of dominant. There's arguments in a more racist angle that say, well, African Americans are just naturally inferior, whether that is intellectually, whether that is emotionally, that they'll be lazy, or they'll be a drain, or they'll be criminals. So there's those kinds of arguments. There's others that say, if we don't intend to give them equality in the country, it's not fair of us to free them and then just leave them in a, in a type of limbo. Um, so lots of arguments sort of behind the idea of colonization. And colonization is a very popular kind of, of quote-unquote solution for what to do after the possible abolition of slavery. Um, and it's popular all the way up through the 1850s and 1860s. By the 1820s and 30s in the United States, you start to see the emergence of a more coordinated, more determined kind of abolitionist effort. As I said, the U.S. is about 20 or 30 years behind the curve. Britain has already seen the growth of that um, in the late 1700s. But the U.S. catches up um, eventually. And there's three main areas that you see abolitionists um, make their arguments. We would like to think that the most important, the most successful, the most common of those arguments was that moral and ethical argument that says, look, slavery is just wrong, you can't do this to another human being, whether you're basing that on biblical foundations, right, all people are created equal by God, whether you're basing it on um, natural law, right, more enlightenment ideas that just say people are supposed to be equal, there was that but it was not the most common and certainly wasn't the most persuasive argument um, that was used from the abolition side. Much more common and much more persuasive were arguments about politics and the economy. So politically, we talked about that question of the balance of power, right? How many free states are there? How many slave states are there? Abolitionists will argue you should get rid of slavery because that way you don't have to constantly be worrying about which side has more states. 
Abolitionists will also argue, and this is where that Calhoun reading really comes into play, abolitionists will argue slavery's existence threatens the Union. It threatens the stability of the Union. Um, Lincoln makes his very, very famous speech, a house divided against itself cannot stand, right? The Union cannot permanently endure either all slave, or rather either half slave and half free, right? He says it's going to have to be one or the other. Because the longer you keep this wedge in the country, the more and more and more it's going to split the different sections apart. And then the other political argument is slaves are going to count in representation according to that three-fifths compromise, but you're not giving them any of the benefit of that, right? Only white men are benefiting in the fact that they get more representatives in those states that have large numbers of slaves. And so Northerners and abolitionists are saying, this is ridiculous, we need to abolish slavery so that the representation in politics is more realistically showing what's happening in the country around us. Probably the most persuasive argument for a lot of Americans is economic, and it is everybody should have the right to sell their labor for the best possible wage. In other words, this is what's called the free labor movement. Um, and I know that term seems a little bit, maybe, I don't want to say confusing. It doesn't mean labor that you don't pay for, right? Free as in free to make decisions about who you will do your work for. And this is not saying black people should have the right to determine who they want to work for, because that's obviously not the way slavery works, right? Slavery is somebody buys a human being and then uses that human being for labor. That's slavery. The free labor movement was not against slavery by saying those enslaved people should be free to choose who they want to work for and choose what jobs they want to do. No, the free labor movement was for whites. It said white people should be able to sell their work to the highest bidder because that's basically what you do, right? When you have a job, the transaction that is happening to get you a paycheck it's not just the employer saying, wow, thanks for everything you're doing, here's some money. You working and you getting a paycheck is the employer buying your work from you, right? So you are selling your labor to that person and you have the right in, in a regular free market economy, you have the right and the ability to sell your labor to whomever you want. And you can make that decision based on the wage, you can make it based on um, benefits or proximity to your house or what you like to do, but you decide who you want to sell your work to. Free labor then, in the case of slavery, says whites should not have to compete with the possibility that an employer can buy slaves to do those jobs that this undermines the ability for white people to have total freedom in choosing the jobs that they want to do. And so the economic argument is one of the more significant and one of the more potent that abolitionists are going to use, and it is in fact one that people even like Abraham Lincoln are going to trot out to try to convince of the um, sort of appeal of getting rid of slavery as an institution, right? So, we talked about the question of how are people dealing with anti-slavery, 
the question then becomes, what are some of the arguments in favor of slavery? And here again, you've read some of those in the primary document stuff. Um, but to just to kind of set the groundwork, there were a lot of people in the North who outright supported slavery. There were a lot of people in the North who just didn't really care one way or the other, right? They were pretty apathetic about the question. There were people in the South who were against slavery. So we can't have this kind of all or nothing um, understanding that, well, the North was against slavery and the South was for it. Again, you can't say those kinds of things about history, right? They're simply not the case. So it was a blurry and fuzzy and very fluid kind of situation. So what kinds of arguments are going to be made here um, in favor of slavery? Well, on the one hand, you have lots of people who say slavery is essential to power the southern economy, right? We don't like it. We don't necessarily agree with it. We would prefer if there was another option, but doggone it, there just isn't, and we have to just make the best of a bad situation, right? This is the slavery is a necessary evil argument. People like Thomas Jefferson makes this argument all the way back into the 17 and early 1800s. It's a very common argument all the way up until the Civil War. It is basically um, sort of overlooking any kind of moral or ethical responsibility. It is refusing to recognize the possibility of other alternatives. It is very much a passive, well, you know, what else are we going to do? It's not the best system, but it works. It's fairly common. Another fairly common argument is the paternalist argument, right? And this is also included in some of those readings as well. Slavery as a positive good, right? Um, that there are actually benefits, not just benefits for the white community, but the argument that there are benefits for the black community as well, right? Not just saying, oh, well, it's positive because it's good for our economy, um, but also saying it's positive because without slavery, African Americans would struggle to make it that they are incapable of being contributing members of society, contributing members of an economy, that either they are prone to violence, they're prone to laziness, that the only thing that is motivating African Americans to do work at all is the slave system. Um, lots of different kinds of what we would call paternalist, right? Oh, well, we're doing this for their benefit, those kinds of arguments. There is also within that the argument that people working in a, a free labor system, right? So a white factory worker or a white dock worker actually suffers more because there's no guarantee that they will have a job. There's no guarantee that they will um, be provided with shelter or food, right? And this is that argument that would say, look, if somebody works on the dock and they get maimed and they lose the use of their arm, they get fired and that's it for them. But, right, and this is the argument at least, you talk about an enslaved person who is working on the plantation and they get mangled and they lose the use of their arm, um, you know, well, the slave owner is going to keep them on. They're going to always have um, a home. They'll always have a place to live. They'll always get food, right? The argument that there is an advantage to being a slave versus being a worker in a free market. This is obviously overlooking the very, very, very real drawbacks of enslavement, 
including the power relationship, the violent treatment, the lack of freedom, um, the lack of control over your own family or your loved ones, right? Huge, huge drawbacks. But the argument is being used in a very different direction. There's the other argument that says slavery has existed since the beginning of humanity. The argument that says if you just look at the Bible, you'll be able to see examples of slavery that are the foundations of civilizations throughout history. That all those advanced civilizations that you read about, whether it's Persia or China or Rome, they've all used slaves as a... Um, sort of a guaranteed labor force, a guaranteed workforce, and that if you want to maintain America's path towards greatness, you have to keep slavery intact and keep it in place. Um, and so this is another kind of angle that people are using to try to say, well, slavery should stay intact, it should stay in place, um, because it's providing these services, or it's doing these things, or we can't figure out a way to get rid of it, or whatever the case may be. So that's going to be um, our breaking point here. We'll pick up next with what happens with the Mexican session, right? That territory that the country adds after the Mexican-American War, and especially what happens with the addition of California, we have another one of these situations where the country is forced to figure out, well, what do we do about territory that's added after the Louisiana Purchase, that's added after the Missouri Compromise? And so, <clears throat> excuse me, we'll look at that. We'll look at some of the questions in the 1850s that will really kind of snowball to the point of almost arguably inevitable civil war. Um, between the question of slavery and the question of not slavery. And so we'll get into that next. Make sure you give me any questions that you've got. Make sure you're looking at those um, full PowerPoints that are on Blackboard. And we will pick up with this soon.